Hey, if you're an actor at the start of your career, or if you're an actor who hasn't started at all, no judgment. But I do want you to know that it has never been a better time to get started with Backstage. Just go to backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code word envelope at checkout for a 30-day free trial. That's 30 whole days. You can browse through thousands of casting notices from thousands of filmmakers, producers, casting directors, all looking for talent just like you. Make a profile, upload a headshot, find out what kind of projects you want to be a part of. Backstage is where you book that very first role. It's also where you book that second role and then that third role and then you keep booking roles all the way up until you win that Oscar. And then you can come join me here on In the Envelope. We love a full circle moment here at Backstage. But first, you gotta subscribe. And again, that's 30 days free if you use the code word envelope at checkout. E-N-B-E-L-O-P-E, envelope, 30 days free, get those roles. And I'll see you back here when I interview you when you win an Oscar. And not wait. Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the one stop shop for actors and creators both above and below the line. I am your host, Vinny Mancuso, Backstage Senior Editor and Professional Entertainment Obsessive. I'll be your guide through every corner of the creative industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. Here you'll find intimate, in-depth talks with today's most award-worthy names in film, television, and theater. Along the way, we'll get advice on living your best creative life, relatable stories of the highest highs and lowest lows, and maybe, just maybe, a rare peak in the envelope. When a porn player sits down and they have to hit F flat, they ain't got to think about it. It's automatic. They've been trained to play that instrument. They play it so much they can do it with their eyes closed. And so that's how I treat my body. My body is my instrument. The boom guy don't have all day to hold that boom while you squeak out a tear. It is your job to get that set and be able to hit your mark and give the director everything he or she needs. Welcome to another new episode of In the Envelope, the Actors Podcast. I am your host, Backstage Senior Editor, Vinny Mancuso. And this is the very first episode of a new year, 2024. And what better way to celebrate all that newness than talking about one of the season's most vibrant, joyous films with none other than the great Taraji P. Henson. Uh, The film in question is, of course, The Color Purple, director Blitz Bazawule's new take on the Broadway musical, which itself, of course, is based on Alice Walker's groundbreaking 1982 Pulitzer Prize-winning novel. And if you're only familiar with the Steven Spielberg adaptation, which came out in 1985, this new version, which is cleaning up at the box office, by the way, I believe right now it's at the biggest Christmas Day opening in 14 years, it's a totally, totally new experience. A musical, of course, but also more of a deep dive into the imagination of our main character, Celie, whose traumas and triumphs we follow in the Georgia of the early 1900s. Seely played here, of course, by Fantasia, who was fantastic in the movie, uh, reviving her Broadway role. And the movie is also a much more faithful to the novel, tender depiction of Seely's romance with free-spirited jazz blues singer Suge Avery, played by our guest Taraji P. Henson. Uh, Taraji was so fantastic here, talking about putting her ego aside to audition for this role, and what her three decades plus long career has taught her about acting, uh, not only just as Shook Avery in The Color Purple, there's incredible craft and career and just honestly life advice in this conversation for any actor, period. Let's get right into it. Here is Taraji P. Henson. Taraji, how's it going? It's so so nice to be talking to you today i'm good a little tired <laughs> yeah i can imagine uh i'm so happy to have you here i would have been happy to have you here any day but i'm so happy to be here talking about the color purple i saw it in theaters a couple of weeks ago and I, I i must say it really did bring the house down from top to bottom performances are incredible uh, it's such a vibrant colorful just joyous film 
and you specifically are incredible in it. Uh, and I cannot wait to talk to you about Thank it. Thank you. Of course, of course. But I do want to, this is a podcast, you know, it's, it's, it's for actors, it's especially for, you know, aspiring actors, people who, who are interested in getting to the industry or, you know, are, are early in their career. So I do want to go back a bit to sort of get an idea of how, you know, the journey that brought you all the way here to The Color Purple. I think I saw that it was around ninth or 10th grade that you you uh, auditioned or applied for the Duke Ellington School of the Arts. Uh, so there's obviously a very early pull for you towards performing. I'm, I'm wondering what was the, 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 the draw towards, towards performance for you in the first place? What, what got you towards acting? I was always a very rambunctious child, full of energy and very creative. I was an only child, so I played well by myself. I had a very creative and vivid imagination. And um, I guess it was my father who who saw that at me in me in, in a young age once he realized I wasn't an athlete because he did try that angle uh, with me because, you know, I was his only child and, you know, men won boys. And <laughs> they like sports. And he put me in this basketball team and I was horrible. And so then that's when he was like, you're an artist. <laughs> so he kind of nurtured that and my family did. And I would always like recite a poem or do a, you know, a cheer or something. And they would sit on the sofa like my audience and I would perform for them doing whatever. And so, but, you know, like I said, as a child, I was very creative, even in how I played with my teddy bears and doll babies and things. I'll never forget I was in kindergarten and it was graduation ceremony. And I remember um, my teacher had me sing the sun, um, the sun will come out tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I remember doing something funny on stage. I'm 53 and I remember it like it was yesterday. I did something funny on stage or I said something really loud. You know, I was being myself and the audience laughed. And I remember noticing that. <laughs> And then it happened again in the fifth grade where I used to, you know, back in the day, they could spank you in school. You know, I used to get spanked in my hand all the time with rulers. And because I was, like I said, very rambunctious, I was a creative kid. And so it was my fifth grade teacher who knew how to channel that energy because I guess she got tired of spanking my hand and she put me in my first play. And I remember I did something funny on stage again. And I remember the audience responding and I was like whoa I just remember the power the feeling of wow I can make them laugh I can make them cry I just remember feeling that and feeling so powerful about it and then I tried to audition for the Gallington School of the Fine Arts I did not get accepted and at that time I was 13 and I was crushed I thought that meant I couldn't act was I 13 or 14 I can't remember I think it was go I was going into the 10th grade so it's more like 15. And right about that time, Color Purple came out. And I remember seeing all those Black people on the film. And I was like, I want to do that. But I guess I can't because that school didn't accept me. But I was just doing, I just knew I had to go to college. I just went and I said, OK, I'll do what she's doing. But I failed pre-calc. It was for electrical engineering. Mm -hmm. I'm not mathematically wired at all. I failed the class that preps you for all the math. So there was a sign there. And I just remember calling my father in tears because I never failed anything. Even if I, when I tried, when I was being the class clown, the teacher still passed me because I made her laugh. You know, I, you know, she wouldn't <laughs> even give me an F. So I was devastated. And I called my dad and he said, great, I needed you to fall flat on your face because you need to see on your own that that's not what you're supposed to be doing. So he encouraged me to go come back up north and go to Howard University and go after my dreams. And once I did that and got accepted into, you know, the fine arts department, it was a wrap after that. I always say, I always say that I had I had a a, a strange childhood because I my dad was a, a theater teacher, so I, he was like the only dad who was upset when I did do sports. He was like, "Why aren't you, why aren't you doing theater?" <laughs> I uh, love it. I love it. <laughs> like you said, you eventually made it to Howard, and you did eventually switch to musical theater. Uh, I was reading this this really lovely quote from 2005, I think it was, it was Mike Malone, who's a professor of musical theater at Howard, talking about, uh, you had a role in, I think it was Dreamgirls, where you, you move mm -hmm. a clothes rack across mm -hmm. the stage. And it was this really wonderful quote that, where he said, you know, you couldn't pay attention to anyone else except for Taraji, uh, which is just really emblematic of who you are as a performer. So I'm curious, you know, from, from that moment of, of education up until now, 
your thoughts on on standing out in in in, in really just making the most of any opportunity you can, uh, no matter how size how big the role is. Yeah, I just I was always taught that there's no such thing as a small role. You know, you just go in there. We all learned that Viola, didn't we? In doubt. So mm-hmm. I mean, you know, you just have to be committed to what you're doing. And it's not even that I make it a point that I'm gonna stand out. You know what I mean? That's not even how I approach my work. I just I approach everything the same. I don't care how big or small or how many lines or how many scenes I'm in. I once I say yes, I'm all in. I'm all in. And that character gets all of me. My body becomes the care. You know, you know, I always say that it's very spiritual what we do as actors because we're lending our vessel to these lives of these other lives you understand and so i understand the weight of that and somebody out there needs to see themselves i don't care if that's one line i don't care if it is me crossing uh, the stage stage left to stage right with pushing a rack some that's somebody's job they need to see themselves you know what i mean so i take what i do very seriously i love that is is there anything from your your, the, you know, your formal education period, you know, your time at Howard or even even before anything technical or, you know, small technique focus, anything like that, that 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 has you still use or anything that's that that has stayed with you from from your your formal education days? Um, All of it, actually. I always remember an acting one on one him, Dr. Henry Adams, may she rest <laughs> in peace. Well, she would always tell us about the moment before, like, where are you coming from? Like, you know, and so that helped me a lot. You making the shift from theater to film because, you know, in theater, you have the luxury of telling the same story every night from beginning to end. In film, you don't have that luxury. Color Purple, two movies in my lifetime, in my career, we started at the, the last, the first day was the last scene of the movie. <laughs> it was Baby Boy mm-hmm. and Color Purple. And so you have to know where you are at all times when you're filming because you you start in different places every day. So that helped me a lot, knowing where I just came from, why I'm in this scene and where I'm about to go. Cause that's always on your mind as a person when you move through life and interact, right? It's where you're coming from. If you're coming out from the cold, you walk in the door differently. You know what I mean? If you're coming in from an argument, your energy starting this scene is very different than if you're waking up. You know what I'm saying? So that mm-hmm. that really helped a lot with me um, making the transition from stage to film as, as far as you know, knowing where I'm coming and going every scene no matter what what we're shooting for the day. And as we sort of jump forward to The Color Purple, you've spoken a lot, and I've, I've heard your castmates speak a lot. You all had to audition for this film. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You're an Oscar nominee. You're an Oscar nominee. You're mm-hmm. a proven talent. You're someone who, you know, you has, like I said, proven themselves. So I'm curious your thoughts on auditioning these days and whether that's changed at all. Well, I had to check my ego. I, I really did, because I did feel a way. I'm not going to lie. I worked my ass off to prove in this town that um, I'm worthy of whatever you throw my way. But there was nothing out there that had me singing like this. So I didn't mind, you know, going in to do that. But then I was like, I got to dance. And they want the whole thing. I said, OK, well, watch this. So, you know, I'm trained theatrically trained. I know how to walk in as the character. And, you know, so that's what I did. I found the dress. I had the perfect shook, sexy dress that I could move in and I would dance and do all the things that almost the dress I wore in the movie did. And I put that that famous red lip on, got me some character shoes. I had on wear real fur. So I found my faux fur stole. I threw it over my shoulders and I put a flower in my hair. And I said, I'm going to give, I'm going to run this shug up the flagpole. And I <laughs> <laughs> Kicked that door open, Sophia style, and I walked in the room. I'll never forget. Blitz said, "Oh, whoa, <laughs> Shug Avery is coming to town." <laughs> you let Blitz tell it. He said I had booked the role within the twenty minutes of me being in the room. So that's why I always tell students and you know actors coming up. I don't care what audition you go to or whatever you go to. Show up. Show up. Yeah, that's that. that, I mean, I I think that it's one of those things that sort of stands out in the film is just how much you you understood, not just, you know, the character, but like the presence of the character, you know, like the character, like who she is as soon as she walks in the room. It sounds like that's something that's important to you. 
as an yes, actor. Yes, absolutely. So you get the you get the uh, you get the role of Sugar Avery. Uh, so I'm curious, you know, for you, what is the what's the first step? You know, you get the role, you get that news. It's time to go to work. I call Stevie Mackey, my vocal coach, and I go work these songs out right away because. I, you know, I'm not as confident. I can sing clearly, but I'm not as confident in singing as I am in acting. Like acting, I can do that. Hands tied behind my back, one eye open, one eye closed. Like that's something that I'm very confident in that. Singing, not so much, because I don't do it often. You know, there was the time when I became pregnant in college, I had to make the decision of whether I was going to go pursue music or musical theater or theater and go to New York or LA. And I just thought, I would have a better lifestyle for my child if I went West. I just, New York just seemed kind of hard to be a single mother in, you know what I mean? Yeah, I wanted to go where the trees and the sun. (laughs) So I think I made the right choice. So I just, you know, once I left and went West and pursued acting, I kind of left music behind. So that's the first thing I had to do. I had to get over my fear of, this music and I wanted that music in my body. I wanted to live in my body so that when I got down to Atlanta, I didn't have to think about it because next we have to add the choreography and now I got to do the lines. I have to talk. I have to say dialogue. I didn't want the music tripping me up. I didn't want to have to think about it. I wanted to be able to, if somebody stopped me off the street, I could sing it, you know, pitch perfect, you know? So I worked and I banged those songs out and I literally had, cause, and, and also I wanted to have fun when we, cause I knew I had to go into the studio to record them and I wanted to have fun. Like I didn't want the pressure of trying to work out the notes or, you know, I just wanted to go into the in the studio and be shook, even in the recording studio. Absolutely. I, I was, I am curious, you know, whenever I watch anything like this and, and when it's a role that requires to, you know, learn the music, learn the choreography, learn the character. I'm curious for you when it comes together, like when does, when does the singing become more of it's shook singing and then and, and not you singing. When, when does the acting and the singing and all that uh, combine for you in the process? When you have everything on, when you have all the, the pieces of the puzzle, I'm on set, I'm in the actual juke joint, I have on the red feathers, I'm coming in on the barge, I have the costume, I have all the stimuli that helps make up, you know, this moment. That's when it becomes fully realized. But, you know, when you're in the studio, singing the songs you don't have all that but you have to imagine it and so I close my eyes and I pretend that I'm there I'm in those places and then that wardrobe I love that I, I, I'm curious about you know I've, I've heard this set was pretty extensive there was a, a swamp that production could drain and that's you know that was sort of your big entrance into Harpo's juke joint I'm curious what that does you know on the day how how important is it for you to sort of have that stuff that you can feel and then touch. And, and, and how important is it to you as an actor? You, of course, you have an incredible imagination, but how is it important to you that you have the sort of tangible things that you can touch and, and see and, and, and feel? Well, it makes it real. I don't have to use my imagination because it's right there. It makes it real. I'm, I'm right in the center of this character's universe, you know, and it's very real. When they yell action, it is real. <laughs> You know, I'm not Taraji anymore. I am Suge Avery and I am coming to town and these people are running down this plank to come and see me. And it is very real. There's a few a few scenes I want to ask you about specifically, just to sort of get an idea of, of you know, what this production was like for you and, you know, what was happening on the day, what your preparation was like. The first I want to ask about is uh, it's a bit towards the end. It's a scene with you and David Alan Greer, who plays your father mm-hmm. in the film. And it's a it's a reconciliation scene, really. But what I find so beautiful about it is that it's wordless. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, you know, as an actor, and especially if it's a scene that's a two-hander like that, where there's no words, but the audience gets exactly what they need to get from it. How do you prepare for something like that? And how do you sort of mark the beats when you know you're not going to have any words to say what you mean, but the audience will absolutely understand what you mean? Those are my favorite scenes. Less is more for me. I've studied Betty Davis. She said she could sue and say so much with just a look. 
And, mm. you know, it's interesting because John Singleton, may he rest in peace, his mother called me Betty Davis Eyes. And I, I just found it interesting that she tapped. She didn't know that I studied, uh, I like have all of her movies, <laughs> you know, because I was always talking, my eyes was, you know, that's like a big feature of mine. My eyes are a huge feature of mine. I was always told John was the one, the director who, made me aware of how powerful my eyes were because you know I came from theater and I was ready to fill the space and be big and when I got in front of the camera he said you he said all you have to do is think it the camera's gonna see it in those eyes and so I I love scenes that have nothing to say because I think I do well in those scenes <laughs> because I like them so much and I knew exactly what that scene was about. You know, he took God is trying to tell you something, which was a huge number in the original classic, which was a beautiful number. Um, but what I what I found very interesting about this is how intimate he made it. And it was something that needed to be worked out between Suge, her father and God. It didn't need the entire town to be a part of that. You know, that's what made that scene so special and so delicate. And that's how we handled it. She didn't know if her father was going to slap her to the floor or tell her to get out again. You know, so that's why she comes in. She doesn't know what he's going to say, you know, and she's just holding her breath the whole way. And so he gives her that it's all good nod. And then she collapses the chest. That scene wasn't in in there originally. That was a reshoot. We came back and got it. Well, it's it, it really it is it's a really yeah. beautiful scene, and it's interesting. How how far how long out from from production was that a was that a reshoot? It was months, yeah, months. The movie was already you pretty much in the can. It was yeah, it was months later, almost. That's uh, interesting. I would say a year later, but just about. I mean, we, it was a while. <laughs> <laughs> so at that point, have you like you know have you is it tough to get back to where you were? You know, like like had you sort of left the roll behind or is is that something that that sort of stays in your in your bones no i i leave the character behind every time i leave the set honey i have to live <laughs> my life <laughs> mm -hmm. i live in between takes like i because i've trained myself to do that i had to learn early on how to turn it on and off because i was a mother early on in my career so when i would leave a set I couldn't bring that character home. When I crossed that threshold, it was time to do homework, time to eat, take a bath, do home, say our prayers, maybe a PTA meeting, maybe a basketball game. I don't know. So I couldn't, you know, I trained myself early on in my career to turn it on and off. I love that. I think that's the, <laughs> that that might be the way to do it. I think I've talked to a lot of actors who have a lot of different processes. It sounds like that should, uh, that should maybe be the mindset. Absolutely. My body is my instrument. When a horn player sits down and they have to hit F flat, they ain't got to think about it. It's automatic, you know, because that's their instrument. They've been trained to play that instrument. They play it so much they can do it with their eyes closed. You know, they don't have to read the music. It's, it's in them, you know. And so that's how I treat my body. My body is my instrument. You know, the boom guy don't have all day to hold that boom while you squeak out a tear. It is your job to get that set and be able to hit your mark find your light and give the director everything he needs, he or she needs, you know? That's your job as an actor. We don't have all day to wait around for you to conjure up these emotions. Like you're supposed to show up ready, you know? At least that's what I think. That's our job. That's what we get paid to do, right? I, so I love I've, that. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I've trained that. No, I've been, you know, and also working on a series as a series regular that helped because you're just pounding it out every day. So now, you know, that further helped me with my instrument, turn it in on and off. And I would be on set and I could be bawling my eyes out, crying, oh, wow, wow, I cut. I'll be wiping my tears. Girl, so like I was saying last night, <laughs> we went to, you know, so yeah, I've gotten really good at it. I love that. And again, it's not, it's, it, it all of this is is incredible to hear, and it's also incredible to to hear when you watch the performances themselves, because you never you never get a sense of that you're not living in the role. It's it's a, it, it makes you such a, a incredible screen presence, really, truly. Thank um, you. Something else I want to ask about specifically is the song Miss Seeley's Blues, which I think I've seen you say was uh, you saw as a as a challenge. You saw it's, it's it, you saw that particularly as a challenge. Uh, I'm curious why yes. that is and sort of how you got over it, not got over it, but you know, how you approach that, that, that hurdle. Jazz, jazz is not easy to think. <laughs> that ain't pop, that ain't hip hop, that ain't a ditty bop. Jazz, that is real music. That is 
half notes and sliding and improvisation and I, things that I don't do, you know? <laughs> so, so I was very, very, very nervous. I was extremely scared. I was concerned because, I mean, this is like a cinematic favorite of this, you know, color purple multiverse. You can't say the color purple and not think of this song. So it was a lot of weight on my shoulders, but I, one thing I do know is I'm going to rise to the occasion. That's why I love to be challenged. Um, yeah, it was just a, a fear to overcome, and I did. Absolutely. <laughs> but I worked on that song, and I worked on that song, and I worked on that song. <laughs> is there anything technical that that either when you're working on the songs or when you're working with a vocal coach that helped, particularly you know, for anybody who's wondering how to, I guess, get into singing or how to improve their singing is there anything that that really helped you get through this or was it was it a combination of, of a lot of things i mean you know like i said it's not that i'm new to singing i studied musical theater so it's something that i can do so i knew that about me i just had to get with the right vocal coach that could help me unlock some things and that was stevie mack my vocal coach in um la and i owe a lot to him because he really got me prepared for all of the singing that i did in the movie and I don't know if you saw or if you're on social media, but there was a clip that went viral of him in a moment where he unlocked something and I hit this crazy high note and I scared myself. Like, I, I didn't even know. I, I like and like I went into a trance and when I hit the note, he was like, yeah. And then I came to and I was like, <gasps> like I grabbed my mouth like I didn't even know that it, it was me. So, um. Yeah, get with a great vocal coach who understands how to meet you where your instrument is. You know what I mean? And how to bring out the best of what you have to offer. And I, I love the idea of sort of unlocking something that yeah. you didn't even know you could do. It, yeah. yeah. It's his approach and how he talked me. You know how sometimes you reach for notes and I kept reaching up top and he was like, no, reach from the bottom. And in that viral video, I did it. I did exactly what he said and that's how I was able to get that big note out and I scared myself. <laughs> well, I'm not scared, I surprised myself. <laughs> I guess it's also an extension of you saying like, you don't, you, you don't do anything unless it's the idea of doing it scares you. So like, you're gonna have yeah. those moments if you're if you're challenging yourself. Oh yeah. Yeah, you should challenge yourself. I don't want anything easy. If if it's easy, what what am I offering then? What am I bringing mm -hmm. to offer to the character? Like I have nothing to offer if it's so easy, right? Absolutely. Um, the last scene I, I want to ask about is something that I think is it's a scene that really is emblematic of this sort of new approach to the color purple, the, the sort of magical realism, uh, really just getting into Celie's imagination and stuff like that. And is the 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 what about love number. And there's a lot that there's that's just a really beautiful scene. And I think with you and Fantasia, a lot is said, not just in the performances, but you know, the looks and, and the way the way that you're you're communicating without what you're saying. Yes. So I just I'm curious about your your preparation for that scene. Anything Blitz told you, anything you talked to Fantasia about. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's just a scene that I'd love to know how you get how you get into it and what the day is like. Well, you know. We had rehearsed it in um, the dance hall. You know, we had a dance rehearsal hall that we rehearsed all the dance numbers in. And, and you know, Blitz would come in with the camera and Fatima, you know, would explain, you know, like, this is like a breath, you know, like inhale and exhale. But we just wanted, I guess, what we really wanted to reveal in that scene is the tenderness of the love that they share for each other. That's why it wasn't a bunch of whimsical moving. You know what I mean? It was just sinking our hearts together. That's what I felt the scene meant to me. Getting in their hearts, becoming one in sync. That is with that choreography, doing the choreography together. You know, two halves of a heart. Look at the staircase. Almost looks like the heart, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. It, it just, it, it goes to show all the, the thought that went into it, not just, you know, the cast, oh, yeah. not just with you, but just everything. The set design, the, the direction. It's just all just sort of, comes together into this tableau of something Absolutely. that's really just... That was both of those women surrendering to love, honestly. Because mm -hmm. by the end of the scene, they've surrendered. They're in a kiss now. And it's it's one of those things that, you know, it, it was downplayed a little bit in the, in the 1980... Not downplayed a little bit, downplayed a lot in the, mm -hmm. in the 1985 version. It's one of the things that, you know, you can't take away from that movie, but also there were some things missing. And that's, that's something that this movie absolutely delivers beautifully. Oh, absolutely. Well, you got to think back then, it wasn't that wasn't a topic we could really talk about freely, mm -hmm. you know? So I, thanks to the advancement of humanity, allowing people to love who they want to love, we were able to to really 
crack that open a little bit. That's why it'll be so exciting to see what happens 30 years from now when we have to pass the baton to the next group who would want to tell the story. Because this book is so vast. You know, we only keep dealing with little parts of it each and every time. Yeah, absolutely. As we sort of come to the end of our time here, I am curious about you know one more thing. I've seen you say that you were approached for the the, the stage version and you know mm-hmm. for, for various reasons turned it down. But I'm curious if you had, for any reason, taken the job back then, how do you think that your sugavery would be different than the sugavery that you are uh, now in, in 2022, 2023? I know it would be different. I don't know how because I can't go back in time. I was a different woman back then. I was much younger, uh, up against a different sort of circumstances in my life. So, I mean, I just really don't know, but I know it definitely would have been different. She probably would have been more mature for sure because I am. (laughs) You know, I don't know. Yeah, it's impossible to say. But I I think, you know, it it kind of, it goes into your, your preparation. You know how to... It's all about where you were before the scenes, how you enter the room, and that'll be different for <laughs> for any circumstance. Yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> so before we let you go, I, I wanted to see if we could do something we call the Backstage Five, which is just five questions. They're, they're more broader questions before we let you go. Okay. Question number one is pretty basic. How did you first get your SAG membership card? When I first moved to L.A., I had a friend, Simbi Kali, who was on Third Rock from the Sun, and my little cousin was on this show called Minor Adjustments, and I did three SAG extra gigs between those two shows, and that's how I became SAG eligible, and then I paid for my SAG card. Because I didn't want that to be an issue, because I came out here knowing I was going to (laughs) work. Absolutely, and you did. (laughs) You absolutely did. Um... (laughs) Question number two, what performance should every actor see and why? Jeez, Louise, there's so many. I, I don't know you know how to answer that, to be quite honest. That's, that's one, okay. It is a big I mean, it's, it is a I, big I, question. Can't, I can't give one performance that kind of power because there's so many performances that I've checked out in my lifetime. Yeah. <laughs> this is, I will say that we have asked this to a lot of people and it is... I, maybe we take it off the list because yeah, it is such a big. <laughs> it is a big question. It's a hard one. I can't. I can't think of one performance really, honestly. To to, to just say this is the one you. I mean, there's so many more to see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Just, I guess the the answer then is is just see what you want to see. Yeah. <laughs> and see what see, see what, what moves you. you. See what touches you. See what see something that that it, that makes you go. God, I want to do that. <laughs> Absolutely. That's. I think that's a great answer. Yeah. Question number three, with all the roles that you've played, um, which one do you think shaped you the most as an actor? All of them. I can't even give that credit to one, even the next one that I haven't done yet. Mm-hmm. I'm continuously being shaped and molded and changed and shipped. Because if I've arrived, then I'm dead. Because mm-hmm. I'm still learning. <laughs> <laughs> also a great answer. I love that. <laughs> Question number four, what do the best directors you've worked with uh, have in common? Casting, because they know who to cast. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, they're obviously good at their job. But not only that, because a lot of times, you know, the director can choose the cast and then you the, the studio may have something else to say. So I love directors who fight for their cast. Also a great answer. And the last question, uh, what is one career mistake you've made in your in your career that you promised yourself you would never make again? Mm, not saying no one time when I should have said no. There you go. No is powerful in this town. And when you know your worth, you'll, you'll sling that no around more often. I think that's very important for especially people that listen to this podcast to hear. I think that's uh, yeah. pretty incredible advice. Yep. Taraji... This was an absolute pleasure. Again, I cannot recommend anyone else enough listening to this podcast, The Color Purple. It is a really beautiful film filled with beautiful performances. And it was a pleasure to talk to you about it. Thank you so much. And happy holidays to you. Yes, you too as well. And happy new year as well. You too. Take care. Thank you. 
thanks as always to our brilliant producer Jamie Muffet and to the whole team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com and don't forget you can subscribe to Backstage with code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. 100% free, you simply cannot beat that. For more exclusive content, find us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Who should we interview next? Let us know. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another peek in the envelope.